Hello, this is the splinting basic session. So why do we splint? We splint to immobilize fracture and soft tissue injuries before and after repair to prevent displacement, angulation, and shortening. Immobilization may be to protect the repair in the case of a post-operative Achilles repair or to position the extremity or joint to prevent contracture as healing takes place. Splints may also be applied to provide pain relief in the setting of an injury. We see this sometimes with bad ankle sprains or non-operative avulsion fractures that a patient may feel more comfortable in the immediate post-injury period when immobilized in a splint. So what do we splint? We splint certain soft tissue injuries and sprains, most fractures, and in certain cases post-operatively for pain control and to protect repairs as injuries heal. Splinting materials include web roll, or cotton padding, as seen in the upper right-hand corner, plaster of Paris or gypsum in the bottom right corner, and an elastic bandage on the left lower corner. You'll see a video on how to apply splints. However, there are some basic principles of splint application. Avoid wrinkle and pressure points. A good way to do this is to maintain the limb in a single position when the splint is applied. Changing position of the limb after a splint is applied is a recipe for wrinkle and pressure points. Also using the thenar eminences and the palm for molding is appropriate. Do not use fingertips as they will leave impressions in your splint and cause pressure points. We like to avoid circumferential cotton as it may lead to a tourniquet effect, especially if it becomes saturated with blood and hardens. Appropriately padding the bony prominences and edges of the cast is key to patient comfort and prevention of ulcerations at the cast edges. It also avoids direct contact of the skin with the plaster, which as the plaster hardens can cause burns as it heats up. Fingers and toes should always be left exposed so that you're able to perform neurovascular checks after splinting. Complications can and do occur when splints are improperly applied. Improperly and irregularly applied padding leads to pressure sores beneath the splint. Inadequate padding material at the ends of the splint can cause sharp edges and lead to skin irritation. Aggressive molding on the splint can yield pressure sores beneath the splint, which go unrecognized as it's covered and inaccessible to the eyes of the provider or patient. Inadequate split thickness or material leads to breakdown of the splint and loss of control of the unstable fracture. Tight application of splinting material or failure to allow for underlying injury swelling without recognition of this problem can lead to limb-threatening compartment syndrome. Using water that's too hot causes an elevated setting temperature and skin burns. Improper splint length, most commonly at the fibular neck, can lead to nerve palsy or inadequate stabilization of the fracture. The next several slides are to showcase some of the splint issues we have seen in the past. You can see our splint museum of bad splints on the right, an x-ray demonstrating a dislocated ankle that was splinted without reduction, and on the bottom, an undermolded, over padded cast that came down to the fingertips rather than the metacarpal heads. This next example is an example of blisters that can occur with improper cast padding. This cast demonstrates equinus, which in some cases, especially that of the Achilles tear, is performed purposefully. However, in most cases, splints should be applied with the ankle in neutral position. Otherwise, this can cause contracture and stiffness. These splints were not applied with purposeful equinus, and this should be avoided. This slide shows poor splinting in several ways. Blistering, high arch position, and splint that goes far past the fingertips. The positions of safe mobilization are here for your review. We typically splint elbows at 90 degrees, the wrist in neutral to 30 degrees of extension, depending on the injury, and ankles in neutral dorsiflexion. There are several types of splints for the upper extremity. The volar slab that lies on the volar surface of the arm, the clamshell, which refers to both volar and dorsal splint material. Our most commonly used splint is the sugar tong seen on the right, immobilizes the wrist and elbow, and a posterior slab, which is used in elbow injuries. Lower extremity splints include the AO splint, which is composed of a posterior slab and a U slab. And a long leg splint is a AO splint extending to include immobilizing the knee. Next is an example of how you perform an AO splint using the sandwich technique. First, you use the patient's leg to measure out the appropriate length of splint. It is okay to be a little long and then cut it back later. It's best to be long rather than short. 
Next, you lay out the splint material as you see here and roll out your plaster. Plaster should be, be between 10 and 12 layers thick. This generally takes one and a half rolls of plaster. Next, the U-slab is measured. Again, the plaster is rolled out. Next, the cotton padding or web roll is measured the same length as your splint, perhaps a little longer at the edges. We usually have about three layers of cotton padding on the side facing the patient and one to two on what will be the outside of the splint. Next, the cotton padding is placed aside and the splint is dipped into the water. You should hold each end of the splint, as you see demonstrated, and rub the splint around, then lift it up by one end and use two fingers to laminate the edges. This helps take out wrinkles and smooth the plaster before it is applied. Next, it is added on to the previously rolled out cotton padding and smoothed once again to remove any more wrinkles. The outside layer being one to two cotton padding thick is now rolled on top. The splint is picked up and placed onto the posterior aspect of the leg starting at the metatarsal heads and ending at the calf. The assistant holds it in place as the next portion of the splint is dipped, laminated, and placed as a U-mold. An ACE bandage is then used to secure the two splints into place, forming an AO splint of a U and posterior slab. Excess padding at the tips of the toes can be folded back and secured with an ACE bandage. If there's excess splint or plaster material, it should be cut using scissors to prevent excess buildup of splint material. Next, the mold is placed, depending on what kind of splint you are placing. The sugar tongue splint is frequently used to immobilize wrist and forearm fractures. In addition to immobilizing the fracture site, it prevents pronosupination. A length of plaster is measured extending volarly to the distal palmar crease, down around the elbow, and dorsally to the metacarpal heads. 10 to 12 layers of plaster are measured on the back table. Lengths of cotton cast padding are measured just longer than the plaster, with three to four layers of padding which will face the skin, and one to two layers which will face away from the skin. A hole can be cut in the first ace bandage to allow it to be passed easily over the thumb. The plaster is dipped in room temperature water and excess liquid is removed. The plaster layers are then laminated on the table. A sandwich is made using the previously arranged layers of cast padding. The sandwich is wrapped around the elbow and secured with ace bandages. A three-point mold appropriate for the specific fracture type is then applied. The thumb spike splint is frequently used to immobilize scaphoid fractures or if there is concern for an occult scaphoid injury. It may also be utilized anytime additional immobilization of the thumb is necessary. A short length of plaster that will extend from the thumb down to the mid forearm is measured, and as before, a sandwich is made using 10 to 12 layers of plaster and the appropriate cotton cast padding. A small strip of approximately the middle third of the plaster can be removed from one end of the splint to allow contouring around the thumb. The splint is applied over the radial forearm, extending up around the thumb. Generally, it is necessary only to immobilize the MP joint of the thumb and the IP joint can be left free. The splint is secured with an ACE bandage. We hope you have enjoyed this introduction to the principles of splinting. The concepts from this video can be readily applied to a variety of clinical circumstances. Thank you for your attention.